PMS. We all know what that stands for, and so do those around us. But what if, leading up to that time of the month, you're suffering from panic attacks, mood swings, frequent crying, anxiety, despair, or even thoughts of suicide? Enter premenstrual dysphoric disorder, otherwise known as PMDD. It is a cyclical hormone-based mood disorder, but is not a hormone imbalance. In fact, it is a severe negative reaction in the brain. To better understand this condition, I sat down with Laura Murphy of the International Association of Premenstrual Disorders, and Laura shares with us her story as well as how to get properly diagnosed and treated for this condition. And as you can imagine, it must be incredibly difficult to live with. And so if this is you or you know of someone who might benefit from this episode, I really would appreciate you sharing it because Laura shares such incredible, valuable information. So let's hear from Laura. PMDD stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It's a hormone-based mood disorder, which affects around one in 20 women and those assigned female at birth. Um, It's a severe form of PMS. The symptoms only occur in the time between ovulation and around the time of your period. So people will often complain of PMS that makes them feel suicidal, or perhaps they're diagnosed with bipolar, that rapid cycling bipolar that kind of comes and goes. We often see people as well who have children or a child or um, a miscarriage, they have a pregnancy, um, who then are diagnosed with postnatal depression and that depression kind of keeps coming and going in waves and no one can kind of pick up the timing exactly, the fact that it's, you know, that the symptoms are ending around around the time of menstruation. And I have to say it affects everyone differently. There are diagnostic criteria, but we're really noticing you know how limiting they are despite the fact you know we need we need those classifications for for order I guess Um, but main symptoms include depression anxiety feeling of being overwhelmed changes in eating habits so perhaps completely losing your appetite or overeating craving certain types of food panic attacks, suicidal thoughts for some people. Some people get um, rage and anxiety, not everyone does. And some people also get physical symptoms such as bloating. Leg pain seems to be one that comes up a lot or leg heaviness, Um, changes in sleeping habits. So some people get insomnia. Um, I used to get hypersomnia, which meant however much I slept, it never stopped the fatigue you know I'd sleep 18 19 hours a day and couldn't keep my eyes open but all of those symptoms for PMDD are contained within that luteal period so between ovulation and around the time of your menstruation so some people it goes the whole two weeks through if you're on a you know a 28 day cycle for other people they may feel worse around the time of ovulation and then it picks up a bit and then maybe they go downhill their period um, and all kinds of different routines within that two weeks for people. So Laura, now now that we better understand why I wanted to reach out to IAPMD, why don't you share um, your story and experience and kind of the role you play, and then we can get into the science and better understanding how to deal with this condition that can probably be so overwhelming, sad, frustrating. I think every emotion in the book is there. Um, so, so please uh, share. Yeah, sure. So um, my symptoms really started about the age of 16. I did start having symptoms. I had a, quite a, a long depressive episode when I was 16 and I was asked to leave school. Times were very different back then. There was no support. I was just asked to leave um, because I wasn't turning up. I wasn't getting involved. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't committing to it. I didn't really want to be there, to be honest. That didn't help. Um, But when I was 17, I took the contraceptive pill uh, for heavy periods. And after day 21, when I skipped to the sugar pills, um, I kind of crashed and burnt really like my life really changed forever on that day. You know, I was on the floor, hyperventilating. Um, My first or full on panic attacks 
I think, you know, um, just crying and sobbing. And then I went into a six month long depression. And then for the next sort of few years, it's a bit blurry really, you know, cause I'm 42 now. So that was when I was 17. But then from then on in, I had longer periods of depression. I also knew I had very bad PMS. Um, it was a bit of a running joke in my um, female, <laughs> with my female housemates at university that I could be a bit scary when I had PMS, but we, you know, it was kind of like a long-standing joke rather than a concern. When I lived with my partner after university, he said to me once, you know, it's like living with a different person for a week, a month. And I remember that so clearly because I don't think I'd really pin down depression and panic disorder, which I was diagnosed with at the time. Let's pop the marina in, you know, it was sold to me as an utter godsend, you know, it will sort everything out. And um, it did help for a little while. I had no periods. I went and backpacked. I think sort of the progestins, the progesterones built up in my system somehow. And I just had an almighty crash where I had what was basically PMDD symptoms for 18 months straight. I was suicidal every day. I couldn't work. I had to give up work. You know, it was probably one of the worst times of my life and you know at that time you know you're going back a few years now I was googling you know um marina depression and finding you know some things coming up on forums I'm making myself sound really old now. <laughs> oh my goodness but you know I was finding these things coming up and I was going to my doctor my GP and saying you know I think it might be linked I think all of this because she'd been she'd been really good actually and sort of been sort of leading me through the the devastation you know, I was told, no, the project, you know, the hormones in the marina can't do that. It doesn't travel outside your uterus. It's all very contained. It can't do that. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. And it was kind of through those appointments I was actually having with my therapist at the time. I paid privately to have therapy um, weekly and she was amazing. Absolutely amazing woman. Um, and it was her that kind of said, you know, this this isn't PMS, like your doctor is saying. Your doctor might just be saying this is PMS and you need to suck it up like every person. But this isn't it. I um, started a patient awareness campaign, Vicious Cycle, because, you know, everyone was saying the same thing. I'm going to my doctor. They don't know what it is. I've been undiagnosed for you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you know, for me, it was 17 years undiagnosed. People were going to their doctors, they're being gaslit, they're being turned away. So we started this um, patient-led campaign, um, Vicious Cycle, and through that, I just connected with so many amazing people around the world. I found out about an amazing doctor in London, Dr. Panay, who's now on IAPND Clinical Advisory Board. We we, we got him in he's amazing so on a sort of medical level through him I, it turns out you know I'd already gone through some of the first line treatments um so we decided to um remove my ovaries so I had a total hysterectomy with bilateral oophorectomy and so I was in surgical menopause at the age of 37 and yeah around the same time I was working with vicious cycle I began sort of communicating with IAPMD, you know, social media, tagging them in on things, um, using their website a lot, really helpful website. Um, and I ended up joining the board of directors. Um, and from that, I then started helping out on social media. Um, you know, it's still a relatively new organization then, we're going back five years now. Um, started helping out social media, then I started acting as a social media coordinator, then social media manager, and now I'm the director of education and awareness for APMD. Really exciting that um, I get to help other people who are going through what I went through and, you know, like you say, help provide resources that are understood by patients and useful for patients. What a story. And I am really sorry for everything that you have had to go through. And I just appreciate the courage that you have to continue to help other women as someone Thank who struggled you. with 
infertility and endo, I know that it's so helpful to help others, but sometimes some days it can be triggering. And I think when you and I got to know each other, we talked about that and uh, giving ourselves permission of this is triggering. I need to take a break. Um, Most definitely. And I think so many people within IAPMD are cycling or um, are post-op for PMTD and PME. Um, so we're very understanding and we take, I don't really like the phrase self-care, it's completely okay to take responsibility for how you're feeling and if you're finding something too difficult or too triggering or emotional we make it very okay for people to step back and have their own time which is quite unique and I have to say I don't feel very brave sharing the story because I used to think it was very unique and now I don't I speak to people all day every day who are going through exactly the same thing you know there's nothing really special about it it's um there's so many of us that are on that kind of difficult path kind of weaving through and trying to get a diagnosis and trying to find the treatment and trying to find the answers well I would say that I don't think one of the descriptions of being brave is that it has to be unique so oh, well, I guess so <laughs> I guess so but so why don't we talk about like first the diagnostic criteria and I think this is important because um, look, I will say some of the things you described, I hear about even like endometriosis and in some cases with, you know, Hashimoto's and other conditions, you know, I'd be curious how you were finally able to get this specific diagnosis. And then we can talk about the treatments. And I do want to cover both evidence-based and the non-evidence-based and how women should, should assess those for their own personal use? PMDD is very on and off. It's literally um, tends to be, you know, like a light switch for people or, or if, you know, that's perhaps not entirely accurate, but like a fade for people. So you have your follicular phase where you feel great, you feel normal, whatever normal is, you know, but you feel good in yourself, you're functioning and you're doing okay and then when ovulation hits it's a very it's a point where you know it's a tipping point where things tend to get very dark for people or um people get very anxious very ragey you know and then when the bleeding stops people describe it often as like a black cloud lifting and that's exactly how I used to feel I remember sitting on the toilet and seeing blood and within two hours just literally feeling like this kind of veil of weight had just lifted from me um and with PMDD like the the symptoms are predominantly psychological some people will have physical pain there's no it's not related to heavy periods it's not related to period pains it's an issue in the brain people with PMDD it's been shown from research they have a genetic malfunction in the brain where the brain cannot handle the normal hormone fluctuations of the sex hormones that occurs in the luteal phase every month so the yep. brain has an abnormal negative reaction to the normal hormone fluctuations where those fluctuations major fluctuations are only occurring between ov ovulation and menstruation that is when the symptoms occur predominantly um, psychological often it's misdiagnosis bipolar rapid cycling bipolar um, yeah, there are, there are physical symptoms, but they're not period pains or heavy period pains or stabbing. It's not, it's classified as a mental health disorder rather than a gynecological disorder, but this is where it gets confusing. <laughs> so it's in the, yeah. um, it's in the DSM-5 as a, um, mental health disorder, psychiatric disorder in 2019 i think it was pmdd was added to the icd-11 so the international classification of diseases um making it a worldwide international diagnosis which is amazing because yeah. now hopefully it will start to be tracked yes yeah, so in the icd-11 it's listed as a general urinary condition with a cross-reference to depressive disorders which is interesting but confusing because it makes Perhaps people think that it's related to heavy periods or bad periods, period pain. It's not. How does someone truly diagnose it, though? Are there elements of blood work? Is there like a some sort of a, 
an actual test? What tends to happen is that blood tests are done to rule out other conditions, so a hormone imbalance, thyroid condition, etc., which is often a problem because for practitioners that don't know about PMDD, it's okay, well, your hormones will come back normal, so off you go, <laughs> where it's not an imbalance, it's currently not picked up in blood tests. So what is currently used for um, diagnosis is historical tracking. So a minimum of two months, really careful tracking of your daily symptoms. Um, Hopefully speaking to a provider that understands PMDD and can see, you know, the clear pattern that PMDD exhibits and pick up, you know, because there's also confusingly premenstrual exacerbation, PME. So that would be someone, for example, that suffered with depression for however long periods they they lived with it for, you know, four months, five months, six months longer. So they would have symptoms all month round, but in the luteal phase, coming up to their period, their symptoms would worsen. And that can be the case for many disorders. So um, arthritis, ADHD, OCD, bipolar. So it can be kind of hard to pick up the two. So we would always recommend people see a provider that understands the conditions and can kind of pick apart that data, that information that you've prepared for them. Right. So to summarize what I'm hearing is that it's almost a diagnosis by exclusion of other conditions. Yeah, by ruling it out, but also seeing that the patterns you're you're exhibiting yep. match the condition well, that kind of on off. Why do people get it? Who gets it? So you mentioned a genetic condition. You're saying there isn't a biomarker, but they're saying it's about genetics. So I guess how, how do they know that? And are there other themes that could predispose somebody to have this condition? So there was research done in, well, research that was published in 2017, where they had shown that they'd found the genetic malfunction. They'd compared uh, white blood cells between those who had PMDD and those that didn't. And they noticed they found a difference in the pathways of people's of your hormonal sort of regulation in the brain um, during the luteal phase. There has been some research done about trauma in childhood. That seems to be a very common factor. Any different kind of trauma, neglect, sexual abuse, there seems to be like quite a high prevalence in the PMDD community, but that's not, you know, that doesn't go for, for everyone. But we do know it's hereditary. Um, we do see lots of people whose parents have had it and then whose, or sorry, mother's side had it. We hear many stories of people whose grandmothers, you know, were sectioned during their menopausal years. Does it get worse in menopause? So in terms of PMDD, some people have it from their first period. Okay. Some people like myself, you know, get it through some kind of, or have have the symptoms triggered by some kind of hormonal interruption. So that could be some people may just have, you know, no symptoms or PMS-like symptoms until they have a pregnancy. Some people find that it worsens with each child if they have more than one child. Um, Some people, it can be a termination, um, a miscarriage. It can be taking a certain type of um, medication. It can be a very, it can be a stressful event. It's not quite fully understood why it gets triggered along the reproductive pathway, but not everyone has it from a teenager. It's common, but not everyone does. Certainly we see people um, where the hormones start jumping up and down faster (laughs) Um, during perimenopause. We definitely do see people struggling more in that period. I wouldn't say it gets worse for everyone in that time because sometimes people respond really well to hormone replacement therapy. I'm listening to you and I'm like, do I have PMDD? So I'm now going to do research and start tracking. Like I almost want to cry. Holy cow. Okay. So I will keep going and um, turn on my podcast host face. You know, a lot of my friends who are in perimenopause, like I've been attributing it to it, but when you're saying like, if this really got exacerbated after I had my son, Mm -hmm. um, wow. Like I'm, I'm kind of in shock right now. I'm really interested in the solutions here. I mean, we have this condition that has a label that is defined. So what are 
solutions. And I mean, I'm almost scared to ask because there's so many ifs, ands, and buts in everything that you've said today that I, I can't even begin to figure out how doctors without the clinical research can put the pieces together in helping women. So as best as you can, I'd love to hear hear those treatments. And you had mentioned in your story, there are tears. So maybe you can walk yeah. through it in the tears. Of course. Yeah. And I can um, supply web links and stuff. We have treatment yeah. algorithms and all sorts to share. First of all, I have to say there's no one, one size fits all. It is trial and error. The best or the most effective treatment we currently have for PMDD is SSRIs. So they work really well for approximately 60 to 70 percent of people again it can be trial and error so some people take them all month round some people take them for the two weeks a month and other people can use them just when symptoms are present so they work differently for pmdd than they do de depression so they don't take you know the, the two weeks to kick in as <laughs> as we're as we're told so they, they do work differently but they do work really well for a lot of people um, Again, not everyone, sometimes, you know, people have side effects that, you know, aren't, aren't worth the, the payoff, but that would be the first thing that um, a doctor with, you know, knowledge of evidence-based treatments for PMTD would start with. There's also um, the contraceptive pill. There's a certain type of contraceptive pill. Um, I think Yasmin in America um, is the only one licensed for treatment of PMDD. So for PMDD, the idea is, you know, complete cycle suppression. So you don't take the sugar pills. You just take the pills back to back, no bleed, no fluctuations, literally just keeping that cycle suppressed the whole time. And again, that works well for quite a lot of people. Some people find that they um, do better on different pills. Some of us, um, like myself, I couldn't tolerate any of the, the contraceptive pills. They all made me kind of um, go off the charts mentally. But so, yeah, some people do really well. And some people, they use both. Um, for perimenopause, I think it's a bit different. I know we're just launching a page on um, PMDD and menopause. And I know one of the things I read was yeah, that um, HRT can be really, really useful. It can kick in quite quickly for people in perimenopause with PMDD along the lines of cycle suppression so in the UK it's not it's not as common in the USA but um, in the UK we have official treatment guidelines from um, the Royal College of Guyanese and Obstetricians so we have guidelines here um, not yet in America sadly or Canada. So I mean could even though the technical guidelines aren't listed would you advise women review the guidelines that I assume are posted on your website and read through them and use that as a guide to have conversations I with their say clinicians? Anyone with PMDD should print off everything they can get their hands on. Okay. Um, on the IAPMD website, we have a free download for providers, professionals of the algorithm. We are just launching actually in the next, um, I think it should be in the next few weeks, a patient or walkthrough of treatment. So there'll be an algorithm and then there'll be a breakdown of each of the treatments, what to expect, how many people it works for, you know, efficiency, what are the potential side effects? When do you know when to, to stop? How quickly should something work and does it depend? It depends on the treatment. Okay. So for example, SSRIs, I believe, work pretty quickly for those with PMDD but again that's if you get the right dose straight away and you okay. get the right type of SSRI okay. things like um, hormone therapy and hormone replacement therapy can be really really difficult for those with PMDD because you're having a surge into your system and if you're very sensitive to any changes ah. so for example when I as I was saying in the UK there's like another step hormone suppression using HRT so where they, instead of using the pill to suppress that cycle, they use HRT methods, so patches, gels, et cetera, um, with an ad back. Starting that, the first four weeks of starting that can be very challenging for patients. Are there things that you're seeing, whether it's on social media, the women that you're working with, that, you know, again, I, I almost feel awkward even saying that aren't proven methodology because mm -hmm. it seems like there's so little we even understand here. 
Um, so I would say the things you've mentioned are proven in the sense that there are trials before a lot of these medications are mm -hmm. released. What, how much we know for PMDD specifically seems to be somewhat debatable. So I, I will admit this is a strange question, but have you seen things that women have tried that maybe are surprising, not as clinically proven as prescription drugs that either you want to caution women about or just mention and just clarify that it hasn't been proven? Like, is there anything else? Because I know as someone, when you're desperate, <laughs> you'll do anything. Um, and I just, I think it's important, especially with social media and so much being promoted without necessarily having a medical background. I think it's important to know what your organization has been seeing and what women need to know. We are not the PMDD police. <laughs> we okay. don't. Yep. We're not going to tell people what to do. We want to inform people with evidence-based resources. That is what we, I don't even want to say promote. That is what we share. We don't, you know, we're not going to tell people what we think they shouldn't and shouldn't try. We're there to put the information together and push for better research right. and, you know, just better inform them and help them on that journey through the treatments that are currently available. Okay. Um, you know, I don't think there's necessarily anything we'd warn people off. We'd always say to people, be very mindful okay. um, of who you're seeing as a provider. Be very, I personally would be very wary of anyone that offered a cure. There's plenty of people popping up on social media now, you know, that can cure your PMDD. I would very carefully check their credentials and their training before moving forward with it. Interestingly, so this is something that came up. We just did a um, the world's first PMDD community coalition, which was really exciting, a roundtable um, back in July. And for that, we formed a patient insight panel. And something that came up as an area of interest for research was antihistamines spread across the, okay. the groups. And I think the only other thing I would say is just know your own body. Um, I kind of realized after I had the marina out and after I did lots of reading that lots of people with PMDD have progesterone intolerance. So they have a hard time and react negatively to progesterone based treatments. I would say just know your body, know and I have, that's not the case for everyone with PMDD. Some people react really well to it. There's just a higher high prevalence. I would just say like know your body if something isn't working for you. So I've been hearing so much about food triggers, you know, there's meditation, yoga, tapping techniques, and, you know, there's such a mental health component. And again, I know everyone is different. Have there been, have you seen themes of things like that, potentially also helping people as additive benefits? They're certainly not harmful, <laughs> right? Anything that's stress reducing okay. is going to help people. Stress will make PMDD worse. Okay. So managing your time, managing your stress levels, bringing those cortisol levels down, all of those things are going to help, you know, their tools in managing the condition. You know, we'd love to give a, a glory story at the end of this podcast and say, if you do this magic, you're healed. It sounds mm -hmm. like this is a reality check where what I'm hearing is there's ways to help. There are resources where there's a community you have tons of stuff on your website that I saw and there are ways to manage it. And perhaps by speaking up about it and being informed, we as women can help doctors by talking to them about it and by working with your organization to help elevate the noise, so to speak. Cause you even also have a list of doctors, I believe on your website who specialize. We, do, we have a, um, a provider directory yep. of doctors who've been recommended by patients. So okay. doctors can't add themselves. It's all okay. people that have seen them and rate them on um, how helpful they were okay. or not. <laughs> so what would you say then is your greatest hope? And you could speak about PMDD or women's health in general. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. That's a big question. I would say... I mean, in terms of PMDD, it's already starting to happen. It's really exciting. So like I said, we just had the, the PMDD roundtable in July, um, bringing together patient voices and professionals. So we had research scientists, advocates, clinicians, um, you know, policy leaders. There just needs to be movement, positive movement in the right direction. Early detection 
for people so they have education so they don't have years wasted thinking it's something that's their fault or they're just not strong enough they're not able to cope with life like other people because that's how I felt you know I couldn't hold down a job I struggled with relationships my behavior would go a bit haywire very often um, and I think early detection for patients that comes through awareness and that comes through provider education so we've just started a um, clinical practice community where people can come for monthly webinars and learn more about it and they can network with other people network with other clinicians and scientists yeah growing IAPMD so we can really you know dig our heels in and get involved and make a, a better future for people you know that's our tagline creating a world where people can not only survive but they can thrive that's you know, great. Like, like you say, um, I, I wish, I, I also don't want it to be the voice of doom and gloom. I know plenty of people that have been diagnosed and started a treatment and done really well. And off they go, they disappear, they go and live their life. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a life sentence. Um, there's plenty of us that unfortunately haven't reacted to the treatment, haven't, you know, responded to the treatment that's currently available and had to have surgery. But that is very much the end of the road for for people it's not like you know the go-to route I think okay. people panic a bit they think you know hysterectomy is the cure and you know there's so many things to try okay. before then but Good. um I think just be comforted that there's a really amazing community around the world of people who will listen and understand and help you no it sounds like it well Laura I really appreciate you sharing your story and again you know, working with this organization and helping it elevate its voice, um, because I do see a lot of posts um, about PMDD. And I know I learned a ton today and just really appreciate the efforts and, and keep at it. I mean, women's health is getting more and more recognition. And the more we talk, the more people listen and hopefully it, it generates more research dollars. Um, so thank oh, you we again. Will. <laughs> We're a small organization, but we are mighty and very loud. <laughs> <laughs>